Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. It's been a while since I've uploaded a pure biochemistry video, but uh, I've been meaning to make this video for a long time. I had this PowerPoint slide just sitting here for several months. And so now we're going to get on it. This is going to be the biosynthesis of sphingolipids. So a fairly complicated pathway. So first of all, let's get an understanding. What are sphingolipids? So sphingolipids are a type of phospholipid that we find in certain membranes that require a large amount of protection, um, either because the cell that they're involved with needs to last a long time. Examples would be neurons. We find these uh, lipids actually in the myelin sheath around neuron axons. Or if that particular membrane uh, needs to protect the cell against certain kinds of hazardous environments like acid, or things like that, okay? So let's note some differences between one of the sphingolipids, which is sphingomyelin, and a general phospholipid. So some similarities are that they, they both have two fatty acid tails. You can see one of them right here in sphingomyelin. You can see a second one right here. They also have a head group. So this one, for example, is phosphocholine. This entity over here with the uh, trimethyl nitrogen, this is actually a trimethylamine. That's your choline, it has a phosphate, so that's similar. In terms of major differences, one, uh, we don't actually see a true glycerol backbone. Okay, there, These fatty acid tails right here are not esterified to that glycerol. There are no esters here. In one case here on the left, we have an amide linkage. So instead of being an oxygen, this is a nitrogen. Amides are more stable than esters. Okay, Esters are what we have in the general phospholipid. These we have an amide, which is more stable mainly due to the resonance that we have by these electrons that are on the nitrogen. They're actually uh, delocalized between the nitrogen and the oxygen right here, okay, kind of right here. Also, uh, the other fatty acid tail is not even bound to an oxygen. It's actually a carbon-carbon bond, and so that makes this much more stable. So overall, sphingolipids are a lot more stable. Now, you might say, well, maybe these sphingolipids are derived from phospholipids, and the answer is no. They're actually derived from palmitate. So for example, right here, we start with palmitate, and we have this enzyme here called fatty acyl CoA synthetase. Again, this uses CoA, it uses ATP, and it's gonna ligate palmitate to coenzyme A. And we get this right here, which is palmitoyl CoA. Now, the first enzyme here, really in the biosynthesis, is serine palmitoyl transferase. This is gonna combine the palmitoyl CoA, at least the fatty acid part of this, over here, with the amino acid serine. And we're going to get this first structure called 3-ketosphingonine. Okay? This is 3-ketosphingonine. Now, the next enzyme is ketosphingonine reductase. This is going to use the reducing equivalents from NADPH. And it's really going to reduce this carbonyl right here, CO double bond, into an alcohol. And that gives us this molecule, which is called sphingonine. The next enzyme in sequence is called ceramide synthase. This is going to use the two carbons, the acetyl group from acetyl-CoA. It's going to transfer the acetyl group really onto this nitrogen right here. Okay? Um, it's in a different orientation right here. This hydroxyl is kind of been flipped down, but you can at least see the acetyl group is now on that nitrogen. And that acetyl group came from acetyl-CoA. That is ceramide synthase, and this resulting molecule is called dihydroceramide. Now the next enzyme in sequence here, this is dihydroceramide desaturase. This is going to use oxygen, O2, and it's a complicated reaction. But what you should notice is that there's going to be a double bond inserted here uh, between these two carbons right here, this carbon and this carbon. You can see that double bond right here. The other thing that's going to happen is this acetyl group is going to be substituted for a longer fatty acid. Now let's count the carbons on it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. In other words, we're actually going to put a palmitoyl group here on the nitrogen um, and substitute that for the acetyl group. Okay? Again, the double bond itself is added uh, by an oxidation through this molecular oxygen. And that gives us ceramide, which is this molecule right here. Now, ceramide has a number of things that it can do. First, let's go left. Uh, there's another enzyme here called glucosal ceramide synthase, which will form a type of molecule called glucosal ceramides. 
These are used to build much more complicated sphingolipids. We're not going to get into that too much here, but understand that more complicated sphingolipids can be built, which have different properties than this one, like sphingomyelin. Okay? That's one pathway we can do. Another one is we can actually form sphingomyelin. So this actually takes ceramide, and the enzyme sphingomyelin synthase actually just puts a head group on it. Okay? Um, the head group is choline, and it comes from CDP choline. So onto this OH group right here, this one, it's going to attach phosphocholine, and that phosphocholine donor is CDP choline. Okay? Again, you're going to get this molecule right here. You can see that phosphocholine that's now on that oxygen. That's this one right here. And this molecule that we formed, this one is sphingomyelin. This one, as is, is good enough to go in membranes, and this is a very common a sphingolipid that we actually find in myelin sheaths. So if, for example, if we look at the central nervous system, oligodendrocytes are a type of glial cell that actually make a huge amount of sphingomyelin. And in those myelin sheaths, they contain a huge uh, proportion of these, of these type of lipids. Okay? Um, and again, because they are very stable, structurally and chemically speaking, from an organic point of view, they provide structural stability and they protect those axons that we hopefully know the myelin goes around. The same thing would be true of Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. So these can go directly into membranes. And there's a bunch of other uses for these as well. Um, in a lot of other organisms that have to have resistance against certain types of environmental stressors, they'll either have sphingolipids or another type of lipid that is very, very stable. So this is not something unique to humans or mammals. There's a lot of different ways that organisms of different kinds can actually increase their membrane stability. Okay. Now, um, this ceramide can actually be degraded. And the way it's degraded is through this enzyme over here called ceramidase. Ceramidase. Uh, it actually destroys it into this molecule called sphingosine. And then sphingonine kinase is going to phosphorylate this, and we're going to get sphingosine 1-phosphate. Obviously, that phosphate is going to come from ATP. Okay? And then the sphingosine 1-phosphate is going to be converted into phosphoethanolamine, and then this leftover product called hexadecanal. Uh, this is going to be through the enzyme sphingonine 1-phosphate lyase. Okay? Now, before we go in any further, um, this sphingonine that's right here, that's in the biosynthetic pathway for ceramide, the sphingonine can be interconverted with sphingonine 1-phosphate. Okay, so if we have some excess sphingonine floating around and we don't need it, it can be catabolized and go in the direction to the right. And that's through the enzyme sphingonine kinase. So sphingonine kinase will phosphorylate sphingonine to make sphingonine 1-phosphate. However, if we don't have enough sphingonine, if we have some extra sphingonine 1-phosphate, then a phosphatase, sphingonine 1-phosphate phosphatase, can remove this phosphate, and we get back the sphingonine, which can be used to make ceramide. So this enzyme right here, or these couple of enzymes, uh, provide a reversibility between these two points in the pathway and allow the cell to regulate um, the pool of sphingonine. If we don't have enough sphingonine, we'll shift this direction to the left so that we can make more ceramide. But if we have excess sphingonine, then we can get rid of some of it by shifting this reaction to the right and going to sphingonine 1-phosphate, which is the catabolic side for degradation. Again, it's not a reversible reaction. It does have two separate enzymes, but we can think about it from a reversibility point of view. Now, again, just like the sphingosine 1-phosphate here, this sphingonine 1-phosphate can be converted into phosphoethanolamine and hexadecanal through sphingonine 1-phosphate lyase. So this enzyme uh, has two functions. It'll get rid of excess sphingosine 1-phosphate and excess sphingonine 1-phosphate. Now, this is kind of a, a, an exercise in recycling because this hexadecanal can be converted to palmitate, and it can be done through this enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase. Hexadecanal is an aldehyde, of course, and aldehyde dehydrogenase, using NAD, can convert it back to palmitate. And palmitate obviously has a variety of functions. One of those is to be converted back to palmitoyl CoA. Now, this phosphoethanolamine can be converted back to CDP choline. Uh, this can be done through the enzyme cytidyl transferase, which uses CTP. Again, this is not a one-step reaction, but again, we can 
uh, allow phosphoethanolamine to be reconverted into CDB choline. Um, this would require some other reactions, but the most important one would be that cytosyl transferase to get that CDP back on the head group. That allows transfer. Now, the CDP choline can go into head group metabolism, which is a separate video, or it can come back over here and be incorporated uh, by sphingomyelin synthase with ceramide to make more sphingomyelin. And so you can see this nice pathway um, has recycling in it, and everything is interconnected. Okay? Now, I would argue that the two goals of this biosynthetic pathway, actually three, are one to make ceramide, which serves as a branch point between two uh, biosynthetic directions. The second purpose is so we can take that ceramide and make glucosal ceramides, more complex sphingolipids, but then also to take that ceramide and make sphingomyelin. So hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of what sphingolipids are used for, but also the biosynthetic pathway where we can take pulmonary wheel CoA and generate sphingomyelin and ceramide. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.